Hey folks, it's Nick with Bootstrap Farmer, and we thought we might wanna talk a little bit about what makes a good raised bed soil mix. Now, most of you are not going to be monocropping in your raised bed, maybe some flower growers out there or something like that, but for most of us, a raised bed in a garden setting, less commercial, although there is a lot of different people that grow specifically for many different reasons. We're talking about floods, we're talking about land access and accessibility, which is why we came up with this kit. But most of you are going to be growing mixed vegetables, herbs, a few flowers, some tomatoes. Let's take a look at some of the things to look out for as you're selecting both the topsoil, compost, and some of the amendments. Let's get into it. So the very first thing we're going to do is cover the soil composition and like your base foundational layer. But before we do that, if you do me a favor, hit that subscribe button, maybe leave a comment below on some of your favorite amendments that would also help us tremendously. Thank you so much. Topsoil is going to provide the bulk and some of the nutrients and take up most of the volume inside of the raised bed kit, while compost adds organic matter and enhances soil fertility. Soil amendments are going to improve the soil structure, drainage, and some of the major and micronutrient requirements of some of the plants. What does the plant need? Let's take a look at the four major things that you're likely to grow inside of your raised bed and what they may require. Number one, vegetables. They need a rich, well-draining soil with plenty of organic matter, while herbs prefer slightly leaner soils with good drainage. Flowers can vary wildly, so most annuals and perennials thrive in nutrient-rich, well-draining soil. But my suggestion is really take a look at what this individual plant variety may be needing from the back of the seed package or your seed rep. And root vegetables are going to require loose soil so the roots have room to expand and grow in the shape in which they're intended. The next thing to consider is your water retention and drainage. Moisture loving plants like spinach, lettuce, tomatoes and cucumbers, they're going to want a lot of moisture. And so you're looking at ways for water to get into the bed and then stay in the bed. So this is uh, items that's going to absorb a lot of water. We're talking about cocoa core and peat moss. Now, if you're doing succulents, herbs, or anything else that's prone to root rot, you're going to want to add something to help it drain. Perlite, vermiculite, maybe some sand in some extreme cases. So if you have lettuce on, on one side and herbs over here and tomatoes in the middle, and you might be doing some companion planting, you may want to just like, dig out a little bit. And so like if you have basil that needs a little bit more drainage versus your lettuce that's right next door, you can create these little micro soil mixes within the bed itself. When it comes to nutrient balance, there's three main things to consider. That is your nitrogen, which is essential for leaf growth. There's phosphorus, which encourages root growth and flower production on anything that blooms. And then we're taking a look at potassium, Potassium is great for overall plant health and disease resistance. And so if we're looking for an ideal soil mix recipe for a general raised bed in which you're going to be growing a little bit of everything, you know, if, if you were monocropping, I would say the bell curve can be condensed real narrow. But since we, we're likely to be growing all kinds of stuff in this mix bed, we're going to widen that bell curve out. We're going to give a versatile raised bed mix using the following proportions, give or take. 40% topsoil, 30% compost, 20% cocoa core or peat moss, and 10% perlite or vermiculite. And for the soil amendments, we're taking a look at compost, which is going to add that organic matter and improve the soil structure. It's going to break down over time and give those microbes a place to live, thrive, reproduce. Worm castings boast microbial activity as well and provide some slow release nutrients. That means that as you plant your plant, the slow release feed your plant over time. It's not like going to buffet and getting so big that your pants fly off because your button popped off of there. It's a nice steady diet of nutrients over time. Another popular amendment is bone meal, which supplies phosphorus for root and bloom development. Next up is blood meal, which is high in nitrogen and great for leafy greens. Now, my suggestion for both the bone and the blood meal, and I'm guilty of this, is it's real easy to get excited and overdose. I would, I would start real lean and then work your way up and give your plants a little bit of time to, as you're putting some of these nutrients out, they're going to get to the roots by the water trickling down, percolating down, and basically breaking down these nutrients. They get absorbed, they get us, gets into the plant. So don't like feed it one day, oh, I didn't see anything. I'm gonna feed it the next day, I didn't see anything. And then it just like explodes with growth and then caches out because it, it ate too much basically. So just 
take it easy in the beginning, follow the recommendations. And I would almost always skew just a little bit less than recommendations because they're trying to sell you more stuff. Another amendment to look at is dolomite lime or lime. It adjusts the pH and supplies calcium and magnesium. And then you're gonna have some regional amendments sometime uh, here in Texas. I really like using green sand. It's available semi-locally, regionally. We also have expanded shale, which I, I used a lot on my farm. And so this helps with drainage and the expanded shale also absorbs a lot of water. So if you're not on board with peat moss for any of the reasons a lot of people may not be into peat moss, you can substitute the cocoa core, maybe mix in a little bit of expanded shale. It comes in all kinds of sizes. Take a look at that, it's one of my favorites. Before I get to my very thought out list, I'm gonna give you a little bit of uh, tips when it comes to filling up a bed. There seems to be a lot of controversy in some of these videos. Do we put logs in a raised bed? Do we not put logs in a raised bed? There's a whole separate video, it's very short. It's in the link below, check it out. You want to choose your location. So select a site for your raised bed kit with at least six to eight hours of sunlight, and good drainage. Now, if you get a lot more, depending on where you're at in the country, depending on a tree line or a building or something like that, in the winter time, as the sun gets lower and it restricts, you may consider moving that out. Hopefully you have the luxury of taking a look at this location throughout the months to really pick the best site. Now, if you do have a landscape bottom like on ours, you may not want to like dump all the amendments in and then get a pitchfork or a shovel and like start banging around and, and, and stirring that about because you may damage the landscape fabric. So I do recommend maybe using a wheelbarrow or a space to kind of mix in some of this stuff, or you can fill the majority of it with topsoil and occasionally putting a little bit of compost raking around maybe a, a smaller pitchfork to turn it over here and there, but stay away from that very bottom likely the root structure is only going to cover the first few inches. If we're talking about, if you know you're going to do a lot of roots, it may go a little bit deeper. Use your discretion, but do find a way to not just have a layer of topsoil and then a layer of peat moss and then a layer of, of amendments because you're gonna have such a concentrated amount of amendments up top that you're likely to burn the plants. So make sure you stir it all up. That's gonna help with your drainage. That's gonna help with the microbes. That's going to help with everything that plant is eventually going to need on that slow release schedule where it's just gradually feeding all the time, draining while at the same time retaining the moisture. Now, the good thing with the raised bed kit is you're not relying on the soil structure that's on property. You have the opportunity to have the very best growing conditions and nutrients that's going to be specific for what you plan to grow. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't soil test, especially if a bed is more than a year or two old where some of those nutrients are going to be depleted. Maybe you're going to change your plant and it's going to have a different requirement. You need to know what your base level is. So just like you would soil test or you should soil test for in-ground growing, raised bed kit, especially after year one, is a good idea to do so. We also talked a little bit about some of those micro pockets. If we're doing companion planting along the way, don't forget to, to rotate your crops. You don't always want tomatoes in this corner and flowers over here. It's a good idea to mix just like you would. It's consider it a micro acre. If you have an acre of mixed garden crops, rotating those out so you're not completely depleting the soil is a good idea. Do the same with your raised bed kit and those fresh amendments, I guarantee you're gonna see better results. And if I had to leave you with one thing, it's going to be this, is please take a look at the nutritional and soil needs of the specific crops before you even begin to buy anything. So you, the same foundation is gonna be the same, topsoil, compost, amendments, but those percentages and the different requirements are going to change depending on the crop. So before you just go out and generalize, do your research up front and amend and fill and compost according to what those plants needs are going to be. That could change seasonally. You don't have to take it all out, but it could mean that you top dress a little different throughout the season or from one season to the next. So uh, we have a lot of videos coming out about these raised bed kits and the deep water kits. It's, it's the same kit, just the configuration's a little bit different. It's all in an effort for Bootstrap Farmer to help you expand your growing year round, both indoors, out, and inside of a greenhouse. And we can't wait to share more information with you. So you don't miss anything, please subscribe, leave a link below. We'd be happy to answer any questions and customer service is also available seven days a week. We look forward to hearing from you. And we'll see you in the next video.